Hey there, Comics Alliance fans. It's me, Matt Wilson, co-host and producer of the War Rocket Ajax podcast, here to introduce another clip from another episode of War Rocket Ajax, the one that will be going up on WarRocketAjax.com next week. Chris Sims, my co-host, and I are going to be talking about three comics in this week's comic segment. The first one we're going to be discussing is Hawkeye, number 19, which we have plenty to say about. Then we're going to be talking about Detective Comics Annual number 3. And then after that, we're going to be talking about the new Vertigo series, Bodies, its very first issue. To listen to this full episode of War Rocket Ajax, be sure to go to WarRocketAjax.com on Monday. You can hear this Every Story Ever episode that we recorded, but for now, check out this clip. All right, where are we going to start, Chris? You want to start with Hawkeye number 19? Let's do it. Let's start with uh, the 2015 Eisner winner for Best Single Issue. (laughs) Do you think think that uh, Fraction and Aja were like, all right, we got the 2014 Eisner sewn up. We got Pizza Dog in the bag. Uh, We just won that. Time to put out the other one. Time to put out the next one. (laughs) <laughs> what about the next Eisner winner? I, I here's my I question. I kind of feel like they did. Here's my question about Hawkeye as a series. Yes. Did you have any expectation when this series started that it would be largely about communication and like I these did. these experimental comics things where there are different kinds of communications that that aren't just word balloons. Yeah, it's it's an, such an interesting thing to take because there's nothing about Hawkeye as a character that implies that. You know, there, there's nothing about the underlying structure of Hawkeye as a character that would imply that he should have, like, as, as you said, stories about communication. And yet, that is what this book is built on, e- e- even down to just the uh, the tracksuit Draculas that we, yeah. you know. That they speak, you know, parentheses, Spanish, maybe? <laughs> and bro. And so you never really know quite what they're saying. And that there's a mime <laughs> involved. It's all stuff about communication, and I think that's really interesting. It's a, it's a really interesting theme for a book like that. And the, the I think the two, well, the one perhaps most uh, revered issue of the series is all about how, like, a dog communicates with the world, Right. Right. Or, or how the dog takes in information. And then in this issue, it's all about Hawkeye losing his hearing. And there are pages and pages of of him trying to understand things or trying to communicate or trying not to communicate. Yeah, and, and, and putting up a barrier for the reader. Right. Which I think is really fascinating. I, was, I actually went into this uh, thinking it was going to be like G.I. Joe 21. And there were good, there was going to be no dialogue. I was kind of relieved when there are scenes that aren't about Clint Barton in this issue that do have yeah uh, dialogue. He, and and the bit where he's reading lips is amazingly done. Um, yeah. Shout out to the letterer. Absolutely, uh, the the lettering in this issue. I mean, uh, David Aja also does a wonderful job. Like there are little boxes of sign language. Yeah, uh, Chris Eliopoulos and David Aja or uh, or, or Aha are. Credited with the lettering on this issue, so I don't know if that's, you know, some of it was just incorporated in the art, and some of it's just uh, Iliopolis, you know, doing traditional lettering. Uh, well, I guess but it if, works amazingly well. I, I guess if you count sign language as a lettering, then then David Aha was doing that. Yeah, uh, but but it's like there's clearly a, like so much work and research that went into this. Um, the way that sign language is depicted in the drawings, like it could very easily just come off looking like a technical manual, right? But right. it doesn't. It looks like a person doing sign language, you know, like like an actual character doing sign language, even though they're just little boxes of the signs. And and yeah, like you said, you know, this is an issue that almost dares the reader to be, like be like, I don't get this, and throw it across the room. You know, there's a there's a barrier to entry to this book, but once you get in there, uh, the the resulting story and the way the story is told is really masterful. I like, I love the way that Hawkeye 
in its in its best moments really figures out new ways to tell stories uh, or or communicate with a reader. It's uh, I, 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 again, it's not a what I expected this series to be, but what it has turned out to be has been really great. Yeah, I actually feel the like a kind of opposite way to you. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, the the barrier that's set up, because I feel like the story is told so well beyond that stuff, just on a purely visual basis, that the barrier that's there, and I think there is a barrier consciously put there, because um, you know they, they've talked about it on Twitter. They've said like you know if you you know if you have trouble understanding what's going on because you don't speak sign language, then you know congratulations, that's the idea. Uh, but I feel like the story is told so masterfully that it, it, it hooks you past it um, and just carries you on through. I think there's a risk there, though. I, I do think I, there's a risk, I, but I think it's a risk that, you know, hell, once you've done the issue where people are communicating with sense, <laughs> then, right. then you're good on sign language. Sure. I, I, I think it's a calculated risk. Yes. But I think there's a risk there of, like, you know, a, reading, a reader getting to the second page, not seeing any dialogue, and seeing – these empty word balloons, right? And being like, okay, I, I, I can't continue with this. But I think the story is very clear, just in the art. Like, even if you, you know, if you can't read the sign language, if you you don't want to look up what the sign language means, there's enough there in the art itself. As long as you know who these characters are and what their relationships are from the previous issues, that you can progress. I think yeah. with with ease. Uh, there's two more things about this issue that I think are worth noting. Uh, one is that I am fascinated by sign language. Uh, I think a lot of people who are kind of obsessed with words are, you know, Ryan North, who is boy. That, if you want to have a dude who loves language, nobody loves language like Ryan North does. <laughs> uh, and he's done you know comics about sign language before in Dinosaur Comics. I, I've always kind of wanted to learn it, you know. Uh, I've just never had the, the the discipline to actually sit down and try to do it, but I kind of really want to. Uh, the other thing is, this issue reveals something that's pretty interesting, which is that Hawkeye has been deafened three times in his life. Yeah. Uh, the, the classic uh, Hawkeye um, was deafened when he put the sonic arrow in his mouth to avoid mind control, lost most of the hearing in his left ear. Uh, but this issue uh, reveals that Hawkeye was deaf as a child and is now deafened again as an adult, <laughs> which that is that is some Clint Barton luck to have <laughs> to have gone deaf three times. Yes, that's rough. Poor fella. <laughs> Hope he gets better because Hawkeye's hearing was actually like fixed through Heroes Reborn. That's one of the things that uh, that's often glossed over, like, Tony Stark not being a teenager anymore. Correct. Was that uh, he got a new body at the end of Heroes Reborn. So, yeah, poor guy. Deaf three times. Do you want to talk about uh, Detective Comics Annual number three? Oof. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, we, got a, we got a couple of DC's annuals this week, and the Detective Comics Annual, we were pretty positive about uh, Brian Bussolato and Francis Manipal's run on Detective. Um, it's visually engaging, even if the story is not, like, super... Like, you know, it, it didn't... I don't think the story super grabbed us. Like, it was perfectly... Uh, what, what, what's the word that people like to throw around? Cromulent? It was a perfectly acceptable story, but, like, very, very nice art and very well done. Uh, the annual I, I read because, you know, traditionally annuals are supposed to be standalone stories. We are both, I think, a couple issues behind on what they're doing in Detective. So I was hoping this one would be a nice way to catch up. Uh, it, it is uh, as Brian Bussolato writing, and then uh, has art by a bunch of people. Uh, I guess uh, Werther, Deledra, uh, Jorge Fornes, and uh, Scott Hepburn are the uh, credited artists of this story, which is broken into like three parts. And only one of those, like only one of the segments really captures that uh, look and that color palette of the ongoing run that we really liked. None of that's what I want to talk about with this issue. Did you read this one? 
I'm flipping through it right now, but I did not read it, no. Okay, the thing I want to talk about is that this is the first appearance of New 52 Calendar Man. And Matt, if I gave you a sheet of paper and said, write down what you think the New 52 Calendar Man is like, I think you, I think you would come up with something pretty close to this, just based on the stereotypes that we have about the New 52. Uh, he's a... Uh, a big, tough, super jacked criminal who is abusing his son on his birthday. Batman finds out that it's his son's birthday, goes and beats him up, and tells him to buy a calendar. Oh boy. <laughs> and that is the new 52 origin of Julian Day. Oof. <laughs> I know. It's so bad. And it's like, it's like, like, Calendar Man is the Silver Ageist kind of villain. Like, he's got that dumb Silver Age name. He's got that, uh, he, he's got the, the gimmicks. He's, but like, this is so New 52 in the worst possible way. Batman telling him, buy a calendar. <laughs> it's the worst. It's so bad. Like, I'd rather he be super gimmicky than that. Oh, yeah, so would I. Yeah. But, like, I hit that... Because all through this issue, like, I'm waiting for Julian Day to become Calendar Man, right? Because I'm like, all right, Julian Day is going to become Calendar Man. No, that doesn't happen. Batman just beats... Oh, and he beats him up in a bathroom. He, like, smashes his head into a urinal. So any any hope I had of getting back into this Detective Comics run from this issue shot down. Completely shot down. Yikes. Uh, now, Matt, you had one that you wanted to talk about as well. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk about the first issue of the new Vertigo series, Bodies. And if you don't know anything about this series, the the pitch is that... It takes place in four different time periods. Uh, one is present day, 2014. One is uh, many years ago in 1890. One is in the future. In uh, Let me look at the actual year here. In uh, 2050. And then there's a story that takes place in 1940. Each different time period is drawn by a different artist. Um, so, so it's an intentional, like multi-artist comic and each artist will do their segment in their time period. Um, uh, Megan Hetrick does the present day. Dean Ormston does 1890. Tula Lote is 2050 and Phil Winslade is 1940. What's established in this first issue is that a different police officer in a different time period, each different time period finds the same dead body. Uh, mutilated in exactly the same way, killed in seemingly the same way, in the same place in London, but in these four different time periods that spanned, you know, 160 years. And that's kind of all this first issue gives you. It gives you each different time period and their characters, and each of them discovering this dead body. The time period that we kind of get the most of in the first issue is the 1890 story. And I really like that part because the dialogue is – like I don't know how people actually talked in 1890. But the dialogue seems very period appropriate. And the same goes for 1940. And uh, Cy Spencer has even kind of figured out this new way of speaking for 2050. And it's, it's this great concept where people have basically forgotten how to speak. So they're constantly trying to remember what words mean. Um, each time period has its own flavor. Each, the different art styles are very distinctive. The coloring is all by, uh, Lee Loffridge, but it, uh, each each time period has its own very distinct color. Like uh, 2014 is very blue. 1890 is this kind of black and white coloring with spot reds. Uh, 
2050 is very yellow, and there's kind of a, a brooding, dark, with orange highlights look to 1940. I think it's 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 almost like uh, Francesco Francavilla coloring in 1940. I think it's really well done. I think it's really intriguing. I would eventually. I don't know what the plan is for this book when it's collected in trade paperback. I'd kind of like to see all four different time periods collected up together because I feel like all you really get from this one single issue is a taste. But it's a very intriguing, enticing taste that I want to see more of. Flipping through it right now because I've got it too, and this is a uh, that is as high concept as a book can get. Yeah, uh, and it looked like just it is very visually engaging. It's uh, sci-fi, it's horror, it's crime, uh, all kind of wrapped into one, and it is totally like right up my alley. It's it's the kind of comics I want to read. So if you're looking for something in that vein, uh, I would absolutely recommend Bodies. It's a brand new Vertigo miniseries. That will do it for this early edition of War Rocket Ajax. Thank you for listening very much, all you folks out there in Comics Alliance land. Once again, if you want to listen to this full episode of War Rocket Ajax, be sure to go to warrocketajax.com on Monday or subscribe to War Rocket Ajax on iTunes to listen to the whole thing. Chris and I are doing checks and recs, some leftover San Diego Comic Con stuff. We're also going to be adding a whole bunch of stories to our Every Story Ever list. We're going to top 100 stories on that list, so you're going to want to check that episode out. But that'll do it for this early edition Thanks again for listening, everybody. I hope you have a great weekend.